Good afternoon, it's Roger Gilbert here in the UK. I'm in the Rongo Rongo Live studio again this afternoon, and I have the pleasure of talking to Chris Jackson. He's the director of UK TAG, and UK TAG stands for United Kingdom uh, Technology for Agriculture and Genetics. And Chris is widely travelled. He attends many shows throughout Asia and worldwide, and has lots of experiences when it comes to animal viruses uh, in the agricultural sector. And he has written in the past for us in our Milling and Grain magazine. Uh, and I have the pleasure of Chris's company in the studio this afternoon, and I'd like to put a couple of questions to him, if he will kindly oblige. Uh, welcome, Chris. Welcome. You're in our Rongo Rongo Live studio, Chris, and uh, I see that you've got a lot of Asian pictures on your your home study wall there. Uh, you spent a lot of time travelling, I understand. Uh, well, we did until we were locked down. Yes, it's been an integral part of my job in promoting British agriculture and livestock genetics worldwide. Yeah. And it has given me a wonderful opportunity to see livestock production throughout the world. And for that, I am very privileged. Yeah. And you write regularly for us, and your latest column in our May issue, on page 38, by the way, uh, deals with viruses uh, from a, an animal livestock point of view, uh, and also deals with the impact that coronavirus might have on the livestock production and uh, food supply sectors. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about um, those experiences, Chris? Well, let's start with the impact on the livestock production. Uh, worldwide. I mean, it is very varied. That is a given. Here in the UK, we have seen the price, for instance, of pig meat um, go down considerably because of a, a, a perceived lack of demand uh, from restaurants. On the, and that's on one side of the, the coin. On the other side of the coin, people eating at home um, probably take slightly more pork because it's not always available in restaurants, but processed meats certainly are available, and that hasn't had an impact on the market for that meat. In Australia, we see the price of lamb skyrocketing because of the world demand for it. Mm. In fact, the livestock farmers there are very happy at the moment. Yeah. Um, so do, do you think that there's different scenarios occurring in different regions of different countries? Very much so. Um, it's all, it, it is demand led, um, totally demand led. Uh, and the, the other major factor we see is uh, raw material pricing uh, and uh, transport problems. Raw materials, for instance, soy meat, soybean meal in America, the farmer's price is very, very low. In the world market, if you try and buy it, for instance, in the UK, it's just an all, at an all time high. So and whether that's entirely down to transport, there is a great deal of difficulty getting commodity around the world with shipping and certainly a, a side effect of people not traveling, uh, the airplanes not flying. So uh, most airplanes, passengers don't realize that the passengers are on the top bit, but the bottom bit is full of cargo. Mm. So that cargo still needs to move around the world and that only now leads the freight planes to take it. So there is a major problem there. Yeah, oh, that's, that's very interesting and something that we don't, we don't often think about. We think about supply being demand in our local supermarkets rather than a lot of these products actually moving between countries or even globally. Well, just, just look on the... Um, we had, we're lucky in the Western world. We have what we like more or less. We had some strawberries for tea the other day that came in from Chile. Now, fresh strawberries can't get from Chile unless there's an aeroplane to get them. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Um, the other question I have for you, Chris, and it's all about, you know, viruses. I mean, we've dealt with viruses in animal agriculture for millennia, almost, and we have uh, precise ways of dealing with them, uh, and some are more extreme than others. But uh, how do you see, uh, for example, biosecurity? Are we... A are governments tending to follow uh, biosecurity measures that you recognise in uh, animal livestock terms? I think we probably will see much more 
nationalism coming into play here because governments and medics know only too well the lessons that we know that quarantine and isolation are about the only things that we have in our arm of viruses unless, in the big unless, we have an effective vaccine. Mm. So when you have this new, a new virus pop up, there is no vaccine. So the only real way all the countries in the world have strived hard to do mm. is to isolate their populations. Mm. We've seen here in England, UK, that it is beginning to, to work. Mm. Um, and in countries that have less dense populations, it's easier. Mm. We look countries like Thailand and Vietnam, which have a predominantly young population, they're having a much, uh, the, the effect there is, is a lot less serious than it is when you come into the United Kingdom that has an aging population. Mm. Yeah, I understand that. Now we're talking specifically about testing, tracking and tracing here as a way of leave, letting off the pressure of the of lockdowns that we're experiencing. Uh, in livestock, is sampling, tracing and tra tracking, is that sort of a similar practice used? Yeah, we learned, uh, we learned a very good lesson uh, with a terrible, terrible outbreak of foot and mouth disease in the year 2000. Effectively, A, how to spread the disease, and then what to do after the event. Um, it was very, very traumatic for the British farming industry. Mm. But what we did learn from it was that uh, knowing where people, where, knowing where the animals are all the time and where they move was critical in controlling outbreaks. So that we know, for instance, if, um, let's just concentrate on foot and mouth disease because that is the paramount um, disease of importance to us, along with the other nose from disease. But if we have an animal is found to have a nose viral disease and we know who it's been in contact with, then we know what to isolate. And I think the same the same principles really apply to the human population and the governments are trying to do it. But because it's, it's, it's relatively easy to track animals, it certainly is a major, major problem knowing where people move around in our free societies that we're privileged to live in. Yeah, yeah, very interesting point. So what do you see coming, you know, in terms of livestock supply and demand uh, going forward? Do you think that we're going to get back, get back to some sort of normality quite quickly? Um, let's hope we do. We have some problems because livestock um, need to be, uh, well, let's get the food on our plates. We need slaughterhouses, we need packing stations, all of which need vast numbers of people. Uh, and so far, we have to have those. And um, mostly the companies have kept open. Smithfield Food in America had to close down because it had problems getting staff. So that, that is going to be um, a problem. And keeping staff separate on the production lines, it's not like a car, nuts and bolts where you can just move things about. Um, if you have animals and animal products to deal with, it's very, very difficult to move people away from their workplaces. Yeah, yeah, as we're finding. And also yeah. it's difficult for people to travel internationally at the moment, which is restricting business as well, I would think. Uh, so what's your next plans, Chris? Have you got uh, plans lined up through UK TAG concerning uh, uh, travel or promotion of UK genetics and agriculture abroad? We are looking at all sorts of alternatives. Um, one of the IT and all the modern things that we have now these conference things are wonderful, but, but and it is a big but. Farming worldwide is terribly, terribly conservative, and it will take a long time before we can actually, I think, gain uh, good business, and, and especially in genetics. Genetics is, for farmers, a lifetime's work. So they're not going to change things quickly and easily because... They've been doing it for generations. It works in their eyes. How we can help them improve it takes a lot, lot, lot of time to get that message clearly through. And then when they do um, agree, then they've got to like the people they're dealing with and trust them. Mm -hmm. I think trust is something that's underestimated and it's not easy to establish. Mm -hmm. And I doubt it's easy to establish 
via video links, and mm. I'm just not sure. But and by e links. by video links or by email, and uh, and it can be damaged over time if those connections aren't kept up. Um, you can damage it very very quickly and very easily. Yeah. Well, Chris, it's been great talking to you this afternoon. All the best with uh, your work uh, in promoting UK uh, livestock and technology around agriculture abroad. And um, look forward to talking to you again. And just for our readers' information, you can read Chris's column in our magazine every month. Uh, the May issue, page 38, deals with uh, agriculture and its, uh, the impact that coronavirus is having on that sector. But thank you very much for joining us this afternoon, Chris. And look forward to speaking to you again. Thank you. Thank you.